Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 353, featuring part two of my interview with Mr. Lawrence Schick, the lore master of The Elder Scrolls Online. This part of the interview, uh, Lawrence talks about his book, Heroic Worlds, which, by the way, inspired my own Dungeons & Desktops book. Uh, he also talks about the evolution of MMOs, uh, what makes The Elder Scrolls Online universe special. I think that you'll find that really interesting. And much, much more. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Lawrence Schick. All right, so let's transition, if you will. I want to talk a little bit about your, uh, your book, Heroic Worlds. Now, this uh, book means a lot to me personally because it was one of my inspirations when I wrote my Dungeons and Desktops book. I, I really liked the format of a Heroic Worlds and uh, the descriptions you had in there. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of why you wrote this book and, and what it was like to write it. Well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a compulsive creator. I always have, not only do I, you know, I work all day at a staff job, then I go home and I always have projects, side projects that I'm working on. Um, and at that time, uh, that just seemed like uh, a, a really uh, a good project that I could work on bit by bit now and then. You didn't have to build up sustained uh, head of steam on it because it was all these little tiny articles. Um, and at the time, I was newly married and uh, uh, working uh, at a new job with microprose and uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, at having kids. Uh, and so, a job that a task, a project that could be done piecemeal like that was really appealing. Um, and uh, it's just a, it was just the kind of sort of obsessive compulsive task that appeals to me so um, so that was why I did that book that was my that was my project in 1989 to, to 91 I remember when I was researching for dungeons and desktops that was a this is one of the few books that was out there on the topic now this has been sort of a flurry lately I was just wondering if you had looked at any of these uh, playing out the world of dice and men or the uh, designers and dragons series yes yes I've seen all those um, uh, there the uh, the latter two are, are, are good survey introductions, particularly of Dyson Men. Uh, John Peterson's Playing at the World, though, is the real gold mine of uh, historical information uh, about uh, early role-playing games and uh, uh, how they evolved. And I, I, people who are really seriously interested in uh, uh, role-playing gaming and the influence that it's had on uh, interactive entertainment ever since, I, I uh, unreservedly recommend uh, Peterson's uh, Playing at the World. All right, so now I'd like to see if we can tie uh, two seemingly very different parts of your life together here, because I'm sensing there's a connection here. Maybe you can elucidate. Uh, but on the one hand, you were running these big LARP events, live action role playing, uh, heavy, heavy emphasis there on history and romantic themes. Uh, but on the other hand, you were founding and running AOL's uh, Games Channel. Uh, so I'm guessing these are very fertile years for you. Uh, yeah, the, 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 actually the LARPs were, uh, were late period microprose more than, uh, more than AOL, but uh, they did, that did, uh, uh, lap over into, uh, into my term as, uh, head of, uh, games at uh, AOL from 95 to 99. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, AOL was the first time that I had such an all consuming staff job that I didn't really even have time for the side projects after a while. Um, so that was, boy, talk about writing the hurricane. Uh, we were inventing online gaming uh, at the time and it was, uh, uh, and changing business models every 18 months uh, completely. Um, it was, uh, it, it was another case of nobody has a playbook for this. We're making it all up. Uh, so I had experience at making up entire businesses, as it turned out, um, and uh, that came in real handy uh, in the uh, online gaming business in the late nineties. I was just wondering. I guess Neverwinter Nights Online must have been part of that. Was that part of the? Uh, it was. About the... Yes, that was on our Games Channel. In fact, it was exclusive to Games Channel for a long time. I was just thinking how the business model impacted that game when they changed. Wasn't it? Wasn't it like a hourly basis when they changed to a? 
subscription model that had an impact on that? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, there was uh, there was a lot of pivoting uh, in the uh, in the online games business uh, at that point. Um, ch ch changes were coming thick and fast. Yeah, I'm thinking it must have been a thrilling time, but also quite quite a scary time because you, know, you know the stakes are so high. Uh, before we get into the Elder Scrolls Online, I did want to uh, pause just for a moment and get your get your thoughts on some of the MMO RPGs that came before it. Uh, namely, uh, Ultima Online, EverQuest, and, and World of Warcraft. And, and kind of what I'm wondering is, just from your point of view, do you see these as kind of a linear progression, or is there something uh, more radical in these uh, shifts between those games? Oh, it's very much... Lin uh, they're very much evolutionary uh, rather than uh, revolutionary. Um, and they're, they're gradually, uh, with, with online role-playing games... Um, you had, uh, uh, they were developed from computer role-playing games, which had taken the original idea of uh, role-playing, which was a multiplayer experience, uh, and turned it into uh, a single-player experience. Um, and then it had to evolve back into a multiplayer experience again, as the capabilities of computers and online gradually allowed that to become more and more fully featured. Uh, so there was a certain recapitulation of, or a certain return to the roots of the, uh, uh, of, of the hobby and of the, uh, the art form. Um, and uh, things that were, had been relevant on tabletop gaming that had not been relevant in single player gaming uh, came, came very much to the fore uh, once we moved into the multiplayer uh, format. Um, uh, playing with real people is very different than, uh, than playing with a computer AI. Yeah, speaking of that, I'm thinking about the uh, the earlier Elder Scrolls game. I've played several of those. I was wondering if you had a, a favorite one. Uh, well, um, now, of course, uh, the lead designer on uh, on Morrowind and Oblivion is, was Ken Ralston, who was one of my best and longest uh, uh, lasting friends. Um, uh, in fact, I just saw him last weekend again. Um, but so I had a previous uh, uh, familiarity with uh, the Elder Scrolls series. Um, and I had really, uh, though, though most Elder Scrolls fans uh, uh, typically pick Morrowind uh, as, as their, their fan favorite game, um, I had actually uh, uh, preferred Oblivion because it was more a distillation of the early approach to uh, of, of Dungeons and Dragons. It was sort of D&D &D, uh, uh, most clearly and, and uh, most uh, distinctively rendered into, you know, this 3D environment uh, for the first time. Um, so uh, that's, that's what really stuck with me. All right, so on to ESO then. Uh, one of the things I found, I mean, there's lots of things that were fascinating about some, I looked at a lot of your uh, other interviews and, and uh, print and video. And one of the things I noticed you said a couple of times, and I was really intrigued by, uh, was that Tamriel is, has a big difference. There's a big difference between Tamriel and some of these other fantasy universes. And that's namely that it's not a sort of created from the top down, like a grand, like a Tolkien, or, or maybe a, a Richard Garriott up there, a sort of writing it all from the top down. Instead, you talk about collaboration and an open world design you say that's what's really key when writing rpgs uh i was wondering if you could talk more about this and the in the origins of this open world design concept sure um the uh you know open collaborative world design uh is not something that that uh, uh was just sort of in the air it, it really started kind of with uh, Lovecraft and his group of writers sort of working together on the Cthulhu mythos. Um, uh, he invited them all in to bring their own uh, uh, take and, and look at, uh, at things. And it was often inconsistent and even contradictory the way that they all looked at it, but that didn't matter. It was still all part of the same thing. Um, and uh, then when we get to role-playing games in the 1970s, then you start having... Uh, people working together to create fantasy worlds. 
uh, collaboratively, people bringing different uh, parts to the experience. Um, and uh, this began to uh, replicate in, uh, in genre fiction as well, with things like the uh, uh, Thieves' World and Wild Card series. Um, and it, uh, it, it, it was uh, still not the standard, though. The standard was still things like you know, George R. R. Martin's Westeros or Gary Gygax's um, Greyhawk, world or uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, Middle Earth, uh, where you've got uh, somebody who decides how everything works and, uh, and everything is at some, at some point figured out. And there is a one source really for all of that. Uh, the uh, uh, Elder Scrolls series, series started out that way. Uh, it was very much uh, a D&D campaign um, brought into uh, a computer game. Uh, like like so many other early uh, computer role playing games, um, but then around as they were leading up toward uh, toward Morrowind, they kind of fell backwards into this this idea that uh, uh, because they had a number of collaborators with a number of different great ideas of of how the world worked, uh, they they fell into this idea that uh, everything that is conveyed in the game. Uh, should be conveyed through the point of view of non-player characters. There's no big sort of encyclopedic reference uh, that that uh, that tells you what's true and what isn't. Uh, everything in the game is uh, is told um, by a character to you. Uh, every book has got an author. Uh, every uh, everything that you come across is a artifact of of one of the cultures of the game. Uh, so that what is actually true um, is much like in the real world a matter of subjective opinion. Uh, so that everything is conveyed to the player uh, in, in multiple layers because you've not only got just the information that you're getting across, um, but instead of just having sort of these omniscient lore dump characters that you run into in, in, in most fantasy worlds, uh, every NPC in The Elder Scrolls um, is a product of his or her own culture. And whatever they're telling you on a factual level uh, also is shadowed and nuanced by their own history, their own agenda, their own culture. Um, so you're getting things uh, on a couple layers at once. And this is great. This is fascinating because uh, this means that uh, you, we as designers uh, have this wonderful tool um, for uh, uh, Conveying culture in a way that uh, is that feels right, it feels realistic, it feels like something people are familiar with, uh, and furthermore, it enables us to be contradictory, which is a wonderful freedom. Uh, we can uh, we can have things um, be told from many different viewpoints, and we don't ever confirm or deny which one is true because they're all as true as as the uh, as the beliefs of the characters that are relating it to you. Um, so uh, uh, that has become also a way by which the many very different designers who have worked on the Elder Scrolls series uh, have been able to get their own viewpoints into the game um, and made it a much richer background and environment than you'll get in most games that may have a single auteur who's deciding all this stuff. There, that was a long answer for you. Oh, that's great. I mean, I think you sort of, this is what you uh, mean when you talk about an unreliable narrator, a sort of a Rashomon-like approach to, so, you know, when somebody says, well, what really happened? You know, you say, uh, there's no, uh, you know, good answer for that, I guess, because it is a subjective answer no matter what. Uh, it is, absolutely. And, and like in Rashomon, which the movie you referred to, which has four distinct points of view, and relating the same incident, uh, the different points of view themselves are a source of conflict that is uh, rich and fascinating um, and uh, adds depth and texture uh, to the experience um, that you don't get from a game with uh, necessarily with, you know, it's all based around a single character, like for example, the Witcher series, which is, which is very rich in its own way. Um, but it's all, uh, it's it's all through the relatively narrow viewpoint uh, of the uh, the single point of view. 
You know, as a fan of collaboration, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised at all. You know, you hear about some of these other games in fantasy worlds. They'll talk about a Bible, you know, like the, the Middle Earth Bible or whatever. Uh, but instead, uh, for Elder Scrolls Online, you have a, a wiki, <laughs> which, you know, that, that's just so appropriate. You know, I, I love wikis myself, just one of my sort of side uh, research interests. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of depressing, though, when you hear teachers, uh, even teachers of writing, say bad things about wikis. You know, like they can't be trusted because there's too many hands. Uh, you know. Well, of course, they're 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 coming from the academic background of of the uh, uh, the single sources of truth, right? Exactly. Um, so so that's what they have been trained to trust or distrust, rather, uh, which is uh, truth coming from many different sources. Um, but it's what we rely on. Uh, we uh, uh, designing a big game like Elder Scrolls Online is profoundly collaborative on every level uh you uh, it, we are the writer designers you know we have to work with every other discipline uh in the uh, uh in the development uh, uh, phase in order to manage the characters and story which is our responsibility um and our ideas come from everybody you know they don't just come from the from the writer designers they come from uh they come from artists and they come from the world builders and they come from the audio guys and they come from uh, most importantly uh, with a game like ours they come from the players uh, because the one of the things I realized very early on about role-playing games and design of them uh, is that they are inherently collaborative even if you're just writing a module for Dungeons and Dragons because you are collaborating with 100,000 people who are going to play this module. Uh, and uh, when you're creating a quest for Elder Scrolls Online, you are creating a quest that is going to be interacted with um, by literally millions of players in different groups and different uh, configurations. Um, and all of them have to find something in that quest that's meaningful for them. And all of them have to find something in that quest that offers them an opportunity to bring their experiences into it and make that experience their own. So that millions of people play that quest and it's never the same. And it works for them all. Uh, that is, uh, uh, that's just, uh, what a fascinating challenge that is. It's just endlessly deep. Um, and uh, to be able to do that, um, you know, to start, start doing that in the, in the mid 1970s uh, and still be doing that 40 years later, there's still, we learn new things every day uh, about how to do that. And uh, one of the reasons why I think Elder Scrolls Online is uh, continuing to, to improve and be, be more successful all the time uh, is that we really listen to our players and we take very seriously the idea that they are our collaborators, and the experience is not finished until they bring their own decisions and personalities and individual quirks to the table and make that final experience a real one uh, that involves everybody that's around them in this uh, three-dimensional multiplayer world. Uh, so, yeah, I get excited about that. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting to me. I, I've seen uh, MMORPGs described often as... Uh sort of like amusement parks you, know, you got all these millions of visitors and they're all riding the same you know dozen or so rides but it sounds like you have a completely different understanding of, of this uh certainly you know you, you go into uh the world of the elder scrolls online and there's almost an overwhelming number of opportunities of ways to play it uh it uh, uh facilitates so many different approaches um, you can just sit around in the tavern and role play with your friends. Um, you can go fishing. Uh, you can build stuff. You can destroy stuff. You can follow quests. You can go and fight other players. Um, it's uh, it's what my friend Ken Ralston calls the dog's breakfast approach to role playing game design. Uh, you just you know you you pile so much stuff in there uh, that the players just never get tired of going into your world because they have not ever uh, experienced everything that there is to experience. And they're, they're never done. Uh, there's more to do. 
and uh, we keep adding uh, more stuff so that they never will get done. That's certainly we're going to keep that up as long as possible. Yeah, that was my experience uh, with the game too. When I, I killed a monster and some bait fell out, <laughs> like bait for fishing. Oh boy! <laughs> All right, now I need to figure out how to fish because that, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, so when I was playing ESO, I, I read several of the books. You know, even in the very first part of the game, there's several books you can read. And it's uh, my understanding you wrote 200 or so of these uh, these books. I forget how many thousands must must be in the game. Uh, for people who love reading and writing, like uh, <laughs> you and me. I mean, these books are a great part of the game's appeal. They add a lot. Uh, but, you know, I, I've seen other people describe it more like flavor text, uh, something along those lines. So I was wondering, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on these books? Do you see this as profoundly integral to the ESO experience? And uh, do you get offended or perhaps uh, depressed when people tell you they don't bother to read those books? Everything is optional. Uh, there's nothing that you have to do really uh, in, uh, in a fully featured uh, uh, online role-playing game. Um, we put our heart and soul into the books as we do into every other part of what we build. Um, and so that, uh, you know, I really like it when people appreciate those, but if people don't read them, that's, that's their option. They're, they're there in that world to do what they want to do. Um, and uh, stopping to read a book, uh, does in fact you know slow things down? It's it's not the most interactive experience uh, offered to you. Um, it adds uh, depth and uh, uh, texture to the background of what you're playing, um, but uh, uh, that doesn't appeal to everybody. So uh, other people have other things to do. It's perfectly fine. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the third and final installment of this interview series. And I'm going to be sorry to see Mr. Schick go. What a great guy. So much fun interviewing him. And I hope you had a good time watching part two. Stay tuned for part three. And as always, I want to thank you. Thank you very, very, very much for your support of this show. For supporting Matt Chat. Remember, guys, if you want to support the show and uh, think it'll cost a lot of money, don't worry about that. I only ask for $1 per episode, so if that sounds fair to you, uh, just head over to that Patreon site in the show notes, and you can sign up to be a patron of the show, and really appreciate that. Also appreciate you guys that retweet, uh, post about the show on Facebook and on websites, uh, ranging from Game Banshee, uh, RPG Watch, and I think I even saw my... Show mentioned a few times on another very popular RPG site. I think you guys know which one I'm talking about. Thank you all. All right, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? Some good news. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a uh, Stig wrote in about this. Actually, I don't know if this is good news or not. Uh, EA, a company that I'm sure is very near and dear to all of your hearts, apparently they are bringing Maxis, Bioware, and more together in a new worldwide studios division. So some their way they're sort of packaging this is, oh, this is going to make us stronger. We'll be united and all this good stuff. We'll have more resources available. Uh, to these teams, but the if you scroll down and look at the comments on these articles, on these uh, on various news sites, a lot of people think this is actually a bad thing, uh, decreasing diversity, uh, sort of homogenizing all these uh, different flavors of games, if you will. Uh, I'm not really sure what to what I make of all this. I'd love to hear your opinion. Uh, do you think this is good news, bad news, or just irrelevant? Uh, and then uh, the second news item, uh, Valve is pulling the games of a certain company called Digital Homicide off of its Steam. Uh, what is Steam? Uh, what is it? Anyway, you know what Steam is. <laughs> Delivery platform? Distribution platform? Anyway, don't even bother looking for this Digital Homicide's games because they're not going to be there. Apparently, what happened, and I was trying to figure get something from Digital Homicide, some of their perspective on it couldn't find it, uh, anything from them about this, but uh, all these various news articles I read basically said that they were suing the customers. 
and uh, critics. So anybody that said something nasty about their games, uh, they would actually try to sue them. At least that's the, the story that I've gotten. And I'm not familiar with their games, but they have one called Dungeons of Cragmore. Sounds like a role-playing game to me. And another one called Krog Wars. Again, not familiar with the games. Don't know what, what this is like from their point of view, but it sounds like some pretty nasty stuff is going down. Uh, if you know more about this, uh, please let me know in the comments. And then finally, my favorite bit of news, and several of you guys uh, wrote, wrote in to me about this. Iron Tower Studio, now those are the guys that did the Age of Decadence game. You might remember uh, my review of that from a while back. Well, now they're back, or they've announced a new game called Dungeon Rats. What a great name. Uh, here's a little bit about it. Uh, starting out as a new prisoner at the bottom of the, gang, of the gang's ruled prison hierarchy, and of the prison itself, you must fight to survive and develop your combat skills, acquiring better weapons and equipment as you go. Recruit allies to your struggle or carry on as a lone wolf and kill anyone foolish enough to stand in your way. Uh, that sounds great. And what is that, Legends of the Fall, Fall of the Dungeon Guardians, something like that, I think has a similar premise, but, you know, who cares? It's called Dungeon Rats. <laughs> it sounds like a good old turn-based, party-based uh, CRPG experience, and we know... Uh, these guys know what they're doing, so I'm really excited about this, and I'll keep you posted as I learn more, and you please do the same. All right, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got another one of these uh, from the Orca Brewing Company out of uh, Mukilteo, Washington. Yeah, uh, This is a mummy haunted cream. And let's see if they say it. They don't say anything else about it. But we do have a nice picture of a decomposing mummy there. And apparently this is some kind of cream soda. Anyway, I was very impressed with their uh, werewolf, howl of the wolf, uh, ginger, uh, ginger ale or ginger beer. So I wanted to try their cream soda as well. Uh, so let's get this mummy open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this mummy's haunted cream here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been uh, smelling it, trying to decide what this smells like. You, uh, you get it. To me, it's the really, uh, really what stands out is the bubblegum-like scent. So if you, uh, the bazooka gum with a comic wrapper, uh, that's what it smells like to me. It really brings back memories of being a kid and a kid and opening up that bazooka uh, bubblegum. There's a little bit of a, maybe a vanilla scent to it, but it's really just about that bubblegum. Uh, let's give it a taste. It's a very light uh, consistency-wise, not a lot of foam or a sort of creamy texture. Instead, it's a quite a light in texture. Taste-wise, you taste that same bubblegum uh, that you were smelling a while ago. So there's a lot of, uh, if you like bubblegum, the taste of bubblegum, I think you'd really like this. Uh, not a whole lot else going on that I can tell. I'll try it again here. Yeah, it really just sort of tastes like a liquefied bubblegum. <laughs> you know, real sweet and sugary. A little bit of a honey vanilla uh, quality to it, but it's mostly just that sort of real sweet bubblegum-like taste. I'll give it one more try. Uh, it's not bad. I mean, I could see uh, drinking one of these on Halloween. Maybe uh, <laughs> it's got enough sugar in it. Uh, you'd still be able, it would still taste sweet, even with all that candy corn and candy pumpkins and whatever else you happen to be munching on. Uh, I gotta say though, I like a little bit more, uh, a little bit more flavor, a little bit more interesting stuff uh, when I'm trying a gourmet soda. Uh, so I don't really know what to think about this one. I think I'm gonna go, f I'm tempted to say four, but I think I'll go three out of five drinking horns on this one. If you're looking for something really sweet and you love the taste of bubble gum, I think you'd really love this one. Uh, otherwise, though, if you're looking for something with a little bit more subtlety to it, you should probably look elsewhere. So we'll go uh, three out of five drinking horns on the Mummy Haunted Cream. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was lo looking for quotes about collaboration, and I found one that I just think is completely awesome. Uh, this is uh, from Daryl F. Zanuck, an American film producer and executive. Apparently this guy worked on a lot of silent films. Anyway, the quote goes something like this. If two men on the same job agree all the time, then one is useless. If they disagree all the time, then both are useless.
See you guys next week.